How did you get involved in human trafficking? You, is that too easy? <laughs> Two different situations. One happened in Moldova, in Kishinev, when my wife was called from police. The police asked her to work with 24 girls who worked in prostitution in Moldova. And their pimp was police colonel. It was the first time when we saw corruption which is related with human trafficking and prostitution inside of the country. It was first turning point. And second, I was in Prague, downtown of Prague, together with my friends from Bulgaria and the United States. I was invited to join them to a downtown of Prague to stay in a bar, with, to talk with Bulgarian girls, and to, I mean, just to share with them with our love, Christian love. And we went there, we spent two hours talking, chatting with the girls, and when we went out, Bulgarian pastor showed me, do you see another bar on the next side of the road? I said, yeah, I see it. He said, this is Moldavian bar. I asked him, what does it mean? Is it the owner is from Moldova? He said, no, 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 no. The girls, prostitutes, they're, they're from Moldova. And I was shocked. I didn't know. It was in 2005, four, excuse me. I didn't know that there are Moldavian bars in Europe. So, and from that day, our life, our ministry was refocused and was changed step by step, day by day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Basically, for 15 years, I was practicing as a psychologist and uh, up to a point where I just felt that it was not enough and wanted to do more. Not sure where God was calling me and International Justice Mission happened to come into our city and they needed someone with my skills and I thought it was a good job. So that's how I got into it but uh, not knowing what it would entail and how that would change me and my life. And until my first rescue, one month into my job, when I was in a hotel room, and five young girls were brought in, ages of 14 and 15, but brought in by the father, an aunt, and a sister. So having lived in Calcutta, seen prostitution, having known that it exists, but not having it hit so close to home and seeing little children being brought and parents taking money and standing there and saying that my daughter is not here. While my, the child sits beside me crying, saying my father brought me, told me he's taking me for an outing. So I think that was the turning point for me to know that this is not something that I can walk away from. So what do you think are the real root causes of human trafficking? It's very complex, Kevin. Since I work specifically just with sex trafficking, I feel that it's very deeply part of my society's acceptance of uh, prostitution and that it's okay. Uh, it's not, people are not outraged by the fact that little children are being um, sexually abused multiple times a day and uh, that there is no sense that we need to go in and do something. So that's one of the first things I think that there is very low regard for women. Uh, they're viewed very differently in our country. Uh, also, there is poverty, there is illiteracy, there is lack of uh, economic opportunities that kind of act as push factors to bringing uh, these girls out from very, very poor families. But also, like I said, a huge amount of gender discrimination that exists which allows them, parents, to let their daughters go and keep the sons back because sons will look after them in their old age, but daughters are considered very dispensable. So there are many things involved, but these are some of the key factors, I think, that push these things. And of course, the demand from our own men for these young girls or for these women uh, for, for paid sex. So that is the demand side and a whole lot of issues uh, as a sociocultural background mm -hmm. of my country. This is misunderstanding or lack of understanding of human beings, our value. When I talk about this, I mean when people sell people, they misunderstand the dignity, human dignity. And when people buy people, when they buy these services, they also don't understand who they are and what they want from these girls and women. So I think that the, the issue is from both sides. We need to talk and about demand and about causes like poverty or um, you know, lack of jobs. But both of them are interrelated with each other in the sense of we don't know who we are as people, as human beings, as creation. 
are people knowingly or unknowingly helping aid human trafficking? Uh, maybe more so on the unknowingly side. Are there ways that either by how we conduct ourselves that uh, we're, we're aiding or feeding human trafficking? Knowingly a lot of it, at least yeah. in India, because we have communities where it's traditional generational prostitution. So their little girls are being brought up to so believe and know that this generational? is... Generational? Generational. What does that mean? That means every generation, all the girls since childhood, they are being trained that they are going to be in prostitution. Their parents are their pimps. Their parents live with them in the brothels. They are called the Beria community, which is from where the Taj Mahal is. It's the symbol of love, but that's where that community comes from, uh, from Agra. And um, so definitely knowingly. Uh, unknowingly, I don't know how much, but like I said, is that most of it is that turning a blind eye, not wanting to look at it, because it's in your face in Calcutta, in, um, and people who are not really addressing it. We have a union of sex workers who are working towards legalizing it, and we have to fight them every time we go in to rescue a girl, because they have developed fake ID for these girls, so that you know a 16-year-old can put up a ID saying that I'm 22, mm -hmm. and the police will look at that and say, oh, okay, she's 22, so we have to leave her behind. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I would say a lot of it comes from the fact that it's intentional, that it's a lot of money, it's a lot of organized crime, so a lot of that kind of impacts the fact that it aids uh, in creating this demand. Media creates a lot of the demand. Uh, having a lot of access to cell phones and pornography creates a lot of the demand. So all of this together is just sort of adding to it. I mean, it's not helping reduce it in any way. You said that uh, there's a lot of money that the parents perhaps in some situations are, are making off their own daughters. Um, and you know, we visited with you folks and do you ever have uh, circumstances where the parents actually want their kids back? Um, you know, either by force even, either legal me means to get them back out of your rehabilitation centers or by force? Have you ever had situations like that? All the time, all the time, especially these community people. They have the top lawyers, uh, they have the money, and they will fight to get these girls back. And they're the ones who are suing me, currently suing my administrator, putting lawsuits, frivolous ones, that why are we providing the girls with legal aid, but just getting us you know, tangled up in a lot of legal work, but definitely making all efforts to make these girls mm -hmm. come out. And whenever these girls are going to court, intimidating them, intimidating my staff, just to create an aura of fear so that these girls leave, go back to parents, and they're promptly re-trafficked. Mm -hmm. We will never find these girls again uh, once they go back to these families. Vladimir, how about you? They sell their daughters when they just for a bottle of vodka in neighborhoods. It's not like they sell them in prostitution to a brothel. They sell them in their homes to their neighbors, to the same to drunk men who come there in a very brutal or dirty way. They just buy this sex for a bottle of vodka for mm -hmm. I mean and just sleep with these girls. So it's it's very different. I mean, yeah. It's mm -hmm. first of all, what I would like to emphasize here, I will not tell you all these stories, but I can tell just a few words. Unconditional love. Mm -hmm. When they see that we love them without any conditions, that our love comes from God and just goes to them, very slow, step by step, they begin to trust us, and then some of them, they start to trust God. Having, they saw us taking a risk of taking them back to the brothels to bring their stuff out, despite us being told by the police and by you know, other organizations who rescued them that don't go back, it's going to be violence, you'll be beaten up. But it was when we went in, it was like their mouths were closed. God had just shut the mouths of all the people who were there, and the girls just picked up their things and left. And later on they said that, how did you trust us to go in there and do this when you know it could have gone so wrong? So that's how I think they just see the way the staff just love on them, and they care for them, and would do anything to keep them safe. And that is the message that I think helps them to understand that you know it's, it's all right to now trust these people 
because it's we've been hurt, we've been abused, we've la lost all that trust, but here are some people who are different because God loves them and they share that love of God with us and that's what makes them trust us. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's nothing that we do personally that um, would have brought this about if it wasn't God working in their hearts. Awesome. Thank you. It in the same area, maybe five, ten minutes walk from each other. <coughs> Psychological Art Studio, House of Change, Early Learning Center, Prevention Urban Center. And sometimes there are some days when I need to visit all of them in one day. Mm. And I have great joy when I go to one center and I see a lot of people there going back and forth, upstairs, downstairs, working in groups, interactions, questions, laugh, tea, coffee, cookies. Then I go to the second center, the same. Many people there, kids, teenagers, they do their, you know, you have teenagers in your home. I think so. so a lot of activities, a lot of games. They, again, they laugh, they, they run, they jump. They, I go to the second center, I, I see small kids, in, six months, two years old, they, you know, they stay on the, on the floor, they play with the game, with the toys, their mothers are around them. So I, I, I go to my office, I sit down in my chair and I said, Lord, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> this day is not in vain. I, I, it's a lot of joy. Get yourself more involved, get yourself more aware, get involved locally. Um, if possible, come across, see projects in other parts of the world. But do what you can in your own small way, in your own small neighborhood or your own area. But just be aware of what's going around you. And if possible, just stop it if you can as much as you can. I don't know a case when somebody was involved in ministry, I mean, I don't know a case from our environment, and said it was a bad decision. I should stay in my home, enjoy my life, watch my TV, and that's it. Mm. Every time when people come, when they're involved, they say, it changed my life. Mm -hmm. I'm changed. I gave, but I won. I'm a winner. So, would you like to be winners? <laughs>